And uh, we just hope that the Lord will speak to you. I believe he will. We had a great time in the time of sharing last night and the message. We're going to deal with something that everybody deals with. How many of you here deal with the subject of doubt a lot? I think this is very timely. I've got some really good information for you. We do have some printed outlines. I don't know how many's back there, but if you'd like a printed outline, if you put your hand up right now, Mr. Doug Glass will bring one to you, and we'll get that done. Usually when I'm preaching, I'll have a printed outline there, and um, you can pick them up on the back on your way in, and that'll kind of help save us a little bit of time. I'm not sure how many we have, so just kind of spread them out as best you can, brother. I appreciate you doing that. I want to say thanks to the media guys. I want to thank, say thanks to Michael for getting those outlines ready for us. And uh, everything that you're going to see up here, they have prepared for you, and they're ready. They are called contributors. Amen? 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 While we're waiting, let's welcome back uh, uh, Pam and Brian Comer from Texas. Amen? 2,200 miles, several contacts, and... I want to tell you, some of the flip-flops y'all sent down there are being used today in the church at uh, Gomez Palacio. They're giving those out to some of the mothers who have children for Mother's Day today. Amen? Isn't that cool? Amen. Well, I appreciate what you guys did last week, uh, Brian and Pam, and we can't wait to hear about it someday. We're going to let him come up and just share a little bit about that. I think missions is a big focus today because... We're talking about Thomas. Now, when you think about Thomas, what do you think about? Doubt. Say it loud. Doubt. Okay. And have you ever told somebody, don't be uh, doubting? I told that to a teenager the other, or yesterday. I said, have you ever heard that? Don't be a doubting Thomas. And she went. <laughs> that was right around the time Jace talked about how old I was. <laughs> I'm getting it. Just remember, young man, I hadn't voted yet, and I'm still praying about it. <laughs> I told him, I said, we took a vote last night. I said, buddy, it's kind of a neck and neck. You might want to bring your family and friends back in the next day. So y'all showed up. <laughs> oh, we, this is a formality. You know, we believe with all our heart that God brought Jace and Emily Hargrove to us. Amen? Now you can say amen. We have watched them grow as ministers, and I'm just proud to have them here. They're very committed to the Lord. They're committed in their marriage, and they're committed to our church, and committed to the house ministry. And uh, we're going to see the house ministry, the youth, we're going to see it grow once again. And we're also glad that, that God has brought Ryan back to us to work with us. Ryan was our associate pastor for a few years, our youth pastor for several years. Uh, now he's kind of taking on the role of, of helping us plan worship things. Everything that happened up here, he planned. Even though he wasn't preaching in Tennessee last night, he's going to preach here some. And guys, we've got a great ministry team. This is the place... To get plugged in. Amen? Amen? Look around. Isn't it great to see what God's doing? Saturday nights are growing again. Come on, let's give thanks. Amen? <laughs> Easter Sunday, two people confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. <laughs> Last Saturday night, we baptized one of those new converts. Last Saturday night. Amen? So we believe God is, is, is getting us a sense of revival. And I want to encourage you to be here, to be a part of it. You see, I don't want to miss what God is going to do. You know, in our country, we take the idea of attending church as well we can and we cannot. We don't have to and we might. And sometimes things get in the way. Well, I'm a little tired today. I understand all of that. But what I want to present to you today is that it's important to be here because God is always working amongst us. And if you're not here, you might miss what Jesus is doing through the church. Now, I know some people will say, well, I can worship God out somewhere else. And I understand that's true. But Jesus said, where two or more gathered in my name, there I am in the middle. 
Let's welcome Jesus to the place today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The story today in the series called Moments After is after the resurrection of Jesus. And after Jesus had appeared to his disciples, he appeared again to his disciples, this time with Thomas present. And we pick up the story in John chapter 20 as we begin the message called Dealing with Doubt. The scripture will be on the board for you. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, the word means twin, by the way. One of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Did you see that? He was not with them the first time Jesus showed up. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails are and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I think we've all had that attitude at times, have we not? Yeah. We can be honest today, guys. If I can be honest, you can be honest. Amen? So then a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. That's the word for today, isn't it? Stop doubting and believe. It's almost like you're on your way to church, okay? And you're having one of those spells where you're not very happy. Maybe traffic, pretty much not on Sunday. Maybe just the fact that some of us like the habit of getting into arguments with our families on the way to church. <laughs> amen? And some of you can say, amen, yeah, it happened today. And so then you come to church and somebody from the platform calls you out and says, hey, why did you argue with your spouse on the way to church? You're like, man, how did that happen? That's what Thomas felt like. Thomas a week ago was saying, I'm not going to believe unless, unless, unless Jesus shows up and say, hey, Thomas, right here. You see, that's who Jesus is. And what I say to you today may be something that hits you right between the eyes and between the heart. I want you to know that if God speaks to you today, it's not me that's speaking it is God, and God has a word for you. And so whatever you're struggling with today or this week or in this season of your life, God has a word for you. Let's stop doubting and believe. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I want to do something to get started in this message about doubt. And I want you to help me. And in fact, if I could get you to help me throughout the entire message, it will make the message flow a little better. And I think we will all uh, be able to participate together as we uh, learn today. I want you to say this phrase. It's three words. It says, I doubt it. Say it with me. One, two, three. I doubt it. Now, when I say a different phrase, I want you to say, I doubt it. For example, the kids came downstairs after 30 seconds and said, the room is clean. <laughs> right? Amen? Does anybody ever believe that one? Is anybody in denial and says, I'm just going to shut the door and not look? Amen? Still doesn't make it go away, does it? I have some funny stories of my children in cleaning rooms, but I won't go there. How about this one? The boss says... Do a good job, and I will double your salary. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that, Jason? How about this? The preacher will not be long-winded. <laughs> oh, man. He said, I highly doubt it. How many of y'all believe you're not supposed to add or subtract to the words? Huh? How about this? Everything on the platform will work today. <laughs> the computer will not freeze up. How about this one? Once April gets here, it will never be cold again in Massac County. I can eat donuts five times a day and still lose weight. The IRS calls and says, we're here to help.
I could just see that. If, if the IRS called one of you, you'd be calling me, Pastor, I need prayer. I'm like, I don't know, man. The government will balance the budget. <laughs> you see, we need to doubt things that are ridiculous, right? There are some things we shouldn't doubt. Listen to this one. God loves me. God's plan is good for me. God never fails in his plan for me. How about this one? An event 2,000 years ago can change everything for me. Amen? Say it this way. Say, your love changes everything. Your love changes everything. You see, that happened to Thomas. Now, I'm going to give you a before and after. And, and can I go on record to say this? Anyone that's ever come to Jesus Christ in, as, in salvation has a story that is a before and after. That's good preaching, y'all. You can say amen on that, okay? There's a before and after. It, listen, if you are the same person today that you were before you came to Christ, you don't have a before and after. And since you don't have a before and after, there's a good chance and most likely you've never come to know Jesus. Because when Jesus changes you, the Bible says it is such a radical change. It's called a new birth. It's called a new creation. Old things passed away and all things become new. There's a before and after. Thomas was the same way. Now, Thomas before was not very impressive. Thomas did not quite get it. He was the guy in the group of disciples that probably many of them like, did not like to hang out with. Thomas was a little negative. In the story we just read, Jesus had been reported alive. He was discovered by the women and an angel announced his resurrection and he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Then he appeared to his disciples and it kind of went like this. Jesus showed up. The doors were locked. You can put the scripture on the screen. I'm just going to refer to it. But the doors were locked, and Jesus showed up in the middle of them and said, Peace be with you. And he said, As the Father sent me, I'm going to send you. That's what happened. And the thing is, in this particular time, this meeting took place, and Mr. Thomas wasn't there. Now, in our scripture today, we see that Jesus is now going to appear to Thomas. Let's talk about this man who is going to have a radical experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I want to talk about Thomas the disciple. Thomas the disciple is listed with the other disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't find the record of when Jesus called him, but we know that he was one of them because he was mentioned in Matthew chapter 10. You see, Thomas was a part of the ministry of Jesus. He was a part of the first mission trip. Say mission trip. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus called his disciples together and he said to them, you can put that on the scripture if you want to, the, the scripture on the board. I'm just going to refer to it. Jesus called them together and he gave them power and he gave them a mission to do. This is in Matthew chapter 10. This is before Jesus was crucified. This was before he was resurrected. And he gave them some power and he said for them to proclaim the truth, to heal people, to raise the dead. Can you imagine what a tall tale that would be? I mean, think about it. What if Jesus told you to raise the dead? You're like, raise the dead? That's what Jesus told these disciples. He told them to give freely. He told them to take nothing with you. Isn't that something? You know, today, if we go anywhere, we have to take the supply with us, don't we? You, we didn't go to Texas without having a few dollars in our pocket because every time we go to the gas station, they want money from us, right? Right? And every time it gets late and we want to sleep, somebody wants money from us to get, you know, the accommodations that we need. Jesus said, don't take anything with you on this particular trip. He's saying, you're going to live totally by faith and there's going to be people there that's going to provide for you. Thomas was one of those guys. He said, don't take anything with you. And he said, stay in people's homes and if they bless you, put your blessing on them. If they reject you, shake the dust off your feet. And then he said, be on guard. He said, be on guard because there are going to be people in this mission that's going to be against you. And might I say to you, Christians, make sure you get this. There will always be somebody against you as you serve the Lord. 
It's not so much that the devil hates you. The devil hates Jesus, and the devil will stand against anybody who wants to serve Jesus. So Thomas has seen and experienced the power of Jesus. On one occasion, 70 disciples came back and said, Hey, we saw demons subject to us. And Jesus said, Don't rejoice about that. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Thomas has experienced the power of Jesus. So he was on the first mission trip. He was also on what I'm going to call the messed up mission to Lazarus. (laughs) Thomas would have thought that was a messed up mission. You see... Word came to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. But let me give you the story. You see, Lazarus was in a place where Jesus had been threatened with death. And Jesus escaped from where Lazarus was in Judea and escaped to where John the Baptist was baptizing. And so he got out. I believe he was probably in the region called Perea. But Jesus had gotten out of there. He was in danger. They were going to stone him. And now he's over here. And word comes to him that his friend Lazarus is sick. So you know what Jesus did? Most of us, if we prayed to Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus is sick, heal him. We want him healed right now. Jesus said, I'm going to wait a couple of days. That's totally unlike what we would do, but Jesus did. Now, can you imagine, Thomas? Uh, uh, You know, Jesus, your friend's sick. What's the matter? What are you doing? Two days later, Jesus reports back to his disciples. He said, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there because you're going to see the glory of God. And Thomas goes, we're going to go back there? And he makes the statement. He says, well, let's just all go back and die. You know what he was doing? He was throwing some negative stuff on the situation. Jesus, don't you understand? Jesus, they're going to kill you over here. And Jesus, why are you going to go there now? Because Lazarus is already dead. So you're going to go there? Lazarus is dead? Jesus, you're going to be dead? And I'm going to be dead too. Welcome, doubting Thomas, the messed up mission to Lazarus. We all know the end of the story, though, don't we? And you would think after Thomas saw Lazarus come back from the dead, Bobby, you would think Thomas would go, got it. But he continued to show his character problem. You see, Thomas had focused on the situation through his negativity. And not only did he not understand that mission, but he had the misunderstood mission of Jesus. At one time, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going away, and where I'm going, you know, and you're going to follow me. And Thomas, here he comes. Thomas says, we don't know. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Do you see the doubter? Can you see the negativity? I mean, Thomas' negativity had become connected to his character. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that so many of us have this problem today. We've seen the power of Jesus Christ, but yet we tend to choose to look on the negative side and we become negative. You see, I don't know that people liked hanging out with Thomas. Maybe they didn't like hanging out with Peter because he's always shooting his mouth off. But Thomas was always the guy going, this will never work. In every case that we read about Thomas, he was negative on the situation. Now, let's talk about his character. Now, you remember this. I'm going to paint his character for you, and it's not very impressive, but I want you to know something. The beginning of Thomas' life is not what's important What's important is the way he ended. And you might say, I'm a lot like Thomas. In fact, if you are a lot like Thomas, it might be good for you today to say, you know what? I'm a lot like Thomas. And see, if you get honest and say, I'm a lot like Thomas and come into the contact of the risen Lord, you can be more like Thomas at his end. You don't have to be predestined to be a doubter. You don't have to be locked into that. It's a decision. Thomas had at least three problems in his character. First, he had a character of distrust. Say distrust. Distrust. He didn't trust anything. And you know, a lot of people are like that today. They don't trust anybody and don't trust anything. We come into the church and say, hey, trust the Lord, trust the Lord, trust the Lord. And they're thinking, I can't trust anybody. You know why so many people are isolated and depressed today? Because they don't trust anybody. And you might say, well, I can trust Jesus as long as he's doing something that I want him to do. But when Jesus tells me something that I don't want to hear and he gets tough on me and gives me tough love and makes me wait two days before I go back to Lazarus or he tells me to go back to a place where I might die, I don't think I can trust him then. We have in our world today... 
a gospel that has been so watered down that we think trusting Jesus simply means that I want Jesus to be the giant Santa Claus in heaven to give me everything that my narcissistic self wants. And when God comes in and says, it's not about you, it's about me, we don't want to trust that because we want it to be about us. A lot of people don't trust Man, we don't trust. There's a lot of evidence to this. I could preach weeks on this subject. Every time I look on social media and somebody starts ranting about a situation, you know what I'm thinking? That person has no one to talk to to whom they really trust. You think people clicking like is giving you the emotional support that you need? It doesn't work. Well, why is it that people don't trust? There's a lot of reasons. I'll give you a few. First, past experience. People don't trust because of past experience. Maybe you were raised by people who neglected you. Maybe you were raised by someone who abused you when you were young. You know why some people can't trust God as father? Because of the human father that they had experience with. Can I tell you something, mothers? A godly mother will make a, an imprint and an impact on children that will be lifelong. There's a reason to go after God. You see, when we go after God, then God supplies everything that we need. And the blessing that we go after comes to us and through us. And it goes to the next generation. We live in a world today where people don't parent anymore as a rule. I thank God for Christian parents. I see Christian parents and Christian families and Christian couples and Christian singles in my room today. I'm thankful you're here. But I tell you what I deal with out there, people out there do not parent. We believe parenting is throwing a device to our children and getting them out of our hair for a few hours. Ladies and gentlemen, those kids need more than that. That's called neglection. And when that happens, those children are going to learn that no one's there for them. Ladies and gentlemen, those kids need us. And the reason why some of us can't parent is because no one parented us. And because we don't know how to trust anybody, we don't know how to give it back to anybody, and you have people who don't trust anybody raising other people who will never learn to trust anybody. And we have this cycle of distrust. And then all that leads to is negativity, despair, and depression. It's very real. Past experience. I mean, I got burned before, so I'm going to get burned again. Somebody said, I'm going to love you forever, and they didn't. And so I'll never be able to love again. Somebody said, I'll be there for you, and they weren't there for you. Somebody who was your very close friend one day stabbed you in the back. And so you learned to protect your heart by just withdrawing from the world. But I'll say this to you right now. That is a very lonely box you live in. And I want you to know that Jesus is here to, to get you out of that box. Amen? Amen. People don't trust because of past experience or promises that are never kept. Somebody give you their word and they don't do it. People don't trust because needs that were not attended. Can I tell you something? Our children, and I'll say this to the mothers on Mother's Day and also to the fathers, your children need more than material goods. I mean, did anybody here get married so that they could get rich? Nobody stood before the man of God. I can see Jim Borum going, I take you, Mitzi, so that I can be financially well off. <laughs> I mean, did, Jim, did you get down on one knee and say, Mitzi, I want to make you well off financially. Will you marry me? <laughs> Nobody gets married for that, but yet we tend to think financial things is the only thing that matters. Well, I give my kids food and clothing and devices, and you think that's all they need? They don't need any of those things near as much as they need your time. They need your time. 
And what happens sometimes is because the family situation gets skewed and, and because there's trouble, we start withdrawing from our children and say, well, they're, they're just like that. Listen, you are the adult. You are the parent. You go into their world and start loving them. Amen? <laughs> Needs not attended makes people not trust. Faulty communication makes people not trust. Communication is the top reason for divorce in America. Faulty communication. How many people go home at night with their families and say nothing to each other? Happens all the time. You see, we're missing out on the God-given gift of intimacy in a family. And intimacy is connected to communication. And we're missing it. And we're going in all different ways to try to get it. You see, I, you know, I can make the case again. People think, I've got 870 friends, when really you may not have one. See, a friend is someone you can connect with, communicate with, be vulnerable with. Do you have anybody in your life that you can be real with? That you can just say, hey, I'm scared. You know, we look at Thomas and we say, Thomas, you had a negative attitude. At least Thomas was honest. Sometimes we talk to people and say, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing great, doing great. <laughs> when you argued the whole way here today. And some of you are putting that argument on hold for about 45 minutes and kick it up again. Some of you will take that to the poor person that's going to wait on you at the restaurant. Don't be that way. Don't go in those places and act like heathens, amen? Those folks are working. We're the people that are to bless them, amen. Faulty communication breaks down trust and, tr and distrust becomes learned behavior. I just don't trust anybody. How did that happen? You learned it. You see, here's what I know about children. Children will trust you until they learn not to. Any one of my ch grandchildren will get on this stage and jump off this stage and expect me to catch them. That's not very smart. <laughs> I mean, I could drop them, but I don't aim to. But when they find out that you can't be trusted, then they have learned not to trust. Thomas had the character trait of distrust, and it led to his doubt. Now, see, doubt is not such a bad thing when it comes against the lie. We ought to doubt the lies. There's a lot of lies that we believe that need to be doubted. If you're one of those persons who was raised in a home where no one paid attention to you, you probably have a self-worth of about zero or negative 10. Can I tell you something? That is a lie. No one here is a zero. You might say, well, why did God give me the parents that he gave me? I don't know what happened to your parents, but I can tell you what God was doing with you. God took the DNA from each one of your parents and he took the exact amount of DNA that it took to make you because God was looking for you. You're important to God. And if you believe I'm not valuable, you're believing a lie. If you've learned not to trust anybody, you believe the lie. Sure, there are, uh, are non-trustworthy people. But I want you to know it's not always that way. I thank God for friends that I have in my life that I can count on, that I can trust. And God has put me in a place where there are people that I can trust. You might say, well, Pastor, you're talking about the past experience. You have not experienced what I have experienced. That's true. But you have not experienced what I did. I was working a job in West Tennessee. Everything was there. We planted a church. The church built a home. We lived there. My family was there. And in one moment, I lost every bit of it. In one moment. You ever had that happen? 
When the house you're living in, they say you've got 90 days to get out. We don't want you here. People that I had led to the Lord, people that I'd baptized. And they said, you're gone. Yeah, I know what it's like. I also know what it's like to get angry about it too. Anybody been there? I didn't think I'd ever pastor again. Because Dave, who would want to do that again? Serve for 13 years and build up something from nothing. And then in one moment, find out that it's all gone. I'm like, I don't want to do that again. And so I'm just doing missions and minding my own business doing missions. And one day I find out that the Eastland Baptist Church didn't have a pastor. And I began to drive up from Tennessee to preach on Sundays. And the next thing I know, the church, without ever saying it, they began to prepare for me to come. The church parsonage is next door. They took all of the furniture, or they cleaned it out, put furniture there, said, you can stay there on Sunday nights. They were tricking me, Jim. <laughs> I didn't want to pastor again. Can I tell you? I didn't want to do it again. You might think, oh, you know, it's not that hard being a pastor. Try this on for size. People that you work with and you minister to, they can turn their back on you and treat you as if you were dead. There are people in Metropolis that haven't talked to me in two or three years that I used to work with every day. You think that's easy? Yeah, not everybody's trustworthy. But praise God, I've got some friends. Amen. I've got folks that are with me. I've got a family that sticks by me. And I thank God for you because if you weren't for me, you wouldn't be here today. And my family's grateful. You see, doubt is negative when it comes against the truth. Doubt is the unwillingness to believe the truth. Let me tell you what it's like. Thomas is like this guy that would say, this is going down the drain. Thomas is a guy that if he was in a staff meeting of the church, when somebody would say, here's an idea of something that we can do, visionary type, Thomas would say, that'll never work. Thomas is the type of guy that said, I'm going to mess it up or it will get messed up. Thomas is the type of guy that would say this. Maybe this will resonate with you. I've never seen a good marriage. Therefore, I doubt that I can have one. Thomas would say, children always rebel against their parents. Therefore, I doubt that I will be a good parent. Thomas would say, friends always stab you in the back. Therefore, I reject them before they reject me. Thomas would say, if anything can go wrong, it will. Therefore, I always expect it to go wrong, even to the point of helping it go wrong. Did you know there are people like that? They so expect to fail that they will actually do what it takes to fail so they can feel good about their failures. Crazy, isn't it? Thomas would say, my parents were not there for me. Therefore, I doubt that anyone will be. Thomas would have said, somebody abused me, therefore I'm worthless, and therefore I doubt that anyone could love me. He did say, no one's ever died and raised himself, therefore I doubt that it can happen. Let me give you something that's very important. Distrust and doubt are decisions. Say decision. In other words, you don't have to live in distrust. You don't have to live in doubt. I'm telling you, to get back into ministry, I had to stop doubting the truth and start believing the truth. God wasn't done with me in the pastoral ministry. Now, 15 years later, here we are. Amen? God is faithful, and I'm very grateful that we didn't give up. I'm very grateful that she didn't give, that she didn't give up. We didn't want this anymore, did we? We had other plans. Man, am I glad now. I get to be here now and experience what's going on at Life Church. And guys, you see what's going on today? This is only the beginning. We got the leadership team ready now to go. We're going to move ahead. We're going to see things happen. We're going to see people saved. We're going to see people, see people baptized. We're going to help people's marriages. We're going to work with people. We're going to see people off drugs. We're going to reach people in the jails. We're going to reach people in Mexico. Praise God, we got a lot to do. Amen. But you're going to have to make a decision. 
Are you going to doubt, distrust? If you stay in doubt and distrust, you know where it leads? It leads to discouragement. Say discouragement. discouragement. Let me give you something on this one. Discouragement is the emotional fruit of distrust and doubt. I don't know anybody that walks around and say, says, praise God, I'm discouraged. <laughs> praise God, that was such a discouraging day at church. I mean, but yet, there's something in us that wants that because it reinforces that negativity inside of us, particularly the one that says that we're worthless. Ladies and gentlemen, when you focus on the negative, you begin to feel negative. Can we say that? When you focus on the negative, you begin to feel negative, okay? Let me tell you something else about discouraged people. Listen, I'm going to give you some gold right here. Discouraged people tend to withdraw. Is it up there? It's not up there, but it needs to be. Amen. Discouraged people tend to withdraw. When Jesus showed up the first time, where was Thomas? You know, a lot of people's like, eh, you know, church, I like church, but you know, I don't really have to go to church. You don't have to go to church to worship God. Okay. When Jesus shows up and you're not there, what are you going to say? Discouraged people withdraw. They pull back. They isolate. Hey, I'm a proponent for gathering together in the name of Jesus. I mean, it's not a law. I'm not saying if you ever miss that God's disappointed with you and he's going to knock your tires out. I don't mean that. But I want to tell you something. I don't like missing. I like being where Jesus is. I like to see what he's going to do. I want to be there. Hey, when people are getting saved, I want to be around. When people are getting baptized, I want to be around. When people are calling people out of their comfort zone to get involved in contribution to this church, I will be there. Somebody say amen. That's good preaching. So that's Thomas. He's discouraged. He's doubting. He's distrusting. But praise God, the doubter. These guys are awesome. Amen. Somebody give some love to those guys up there. Amen. The doubter was delivered. The doubter Thomas was delivered. Here's the good news. I'm pretty sure that 90% of the people that's listening to me today, I've said something that applies to you. And now if you want to be honest, you can say amen. <laughs> okay? Now, that's the before. Let's see the after. I have been Thomas in my life. Anybody else? I'll wait on you. I have been Thomas. Can you make a confession? I have been Thomas. Hey, if we want to make this a 12-step group, hi, my name's Thomas. <laughs> yeah, hi, my name's Thomas. See, you, you, we can learn, amen? But we've all been there. But Thomas didn't end that way, praise God. You see, here's what happened. Thomas made a demand. He had gotten his stubbornness and his will involved. He said, unless I see this Lest I see the prince, lest I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. I mean, his stubbornness was in full force. I will not. He didn't say I can't. He said I won't. You see the word decision again? You see, the emotions of discouragement were there. He had made decisions not to believe. But the good thing is, he was honest. And his demand brought about the truth because seven days after he made that great statement, guess who shows up? You might have been making those kind of statements all day, all week, but can I report to you today? Guess who showed up today? Anybody sense the presence of God's Holy Spirit here today? Huh? So here in this room, the truth shows up. And Thomas sees the Lord and he makes the confession, my Lord and my God. How did he come out of this doubt? Let me give you three things. To deal with doubt, we need some help. Say, we need some help. What does that mean? It means this. When Thomas looked at the other disciples and said, I'm not going to believe. You know what they did? They witnessed to him. They went to the doubter and said, we've seen the Lord. Can I tell you something today? God needs you to help some doubters out there. 
okay? We're not going to come out of it without help. You see, a lot of times in the church when somebody falls off or falls away or gets discouraged or isolates, what we tend to want to do in the church is instead of bringing a witness back to them, we tend to just make a judgment or condemnation. Did anybody ever get right with God because somebody judged you? I'm not talking about not telling you the truth. We need to tell people the truth. But I'm talking about putting you down and reinforcing the negativity that you already sense. You see, the disciples heard Thomas, and they were patient with him. There's no record of them arguing with him. They didn't have to argue. You know why? They were confident. You know why they were confident? Because they saw the Lord. You see, here's what I think, Jake. I think Jesus can change anyone's life. And someone can argue with me. Somebody can say, no, he can't change this part of me. Or he can't take me out of this situation because I've already experienced it. And unless I see X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to believe. They can try to argue with me all day long. But you know what? I know Jesus can change people's lives. You know why? I see it. I know that Jesus can change people's lives. You know why? Because I see it. I see it. You know what? I've also experienced it. I don't have to get into an argument with anybody about what Jesus can do because I have already seen it. And the disciples were like, yeah, Thomas, go ahead. Talk it up, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas, go ahead. Let, let's know about it. <laughs> hey, can, can you imagine what Thomas is going to say when he sees the Lord? <laughs> yeah, you see how he is now? Watch how he's going to be. Because Jesus is going to show up some of these days. I want you to understand something today. People in your life might be saying, I'm never going to go to that church. I'm never going to get right with God. I'm never going to stop what I'm doing. All you got to do is say, uh-huh, keep on talking. Keep on talking. Because I know who the risen Lord is. And I know what he can do. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. We need some help. The second thing to deal with doubt, we need to be honest. Today, would you be honest before the Lord? Would you be honest? Thomas was honest. He said, except I see this, I can't believe. I won't believe. Will you be honest? Jesus did not chastise Thomas for his honesty, did he? In fact, Jesus appeared to him. And if you are, have doubts today, I want to suggest to you to bring them to the Lord. Just come and say, God, I'm a mess. God, I don't know if you can fix the mess that I'm in. But come before God and be honest and do the third thing, seek the truth. Some of you think I'm just a loser and no good and God has thrown me away and I'll never be right with God. That's a lie. And today we come before Jesus to seek the truth. And when you're honest and you seek the truth, Jesus shows up and he says, here I am. And ladies and gentlemen, the story with Thomas doesn't end there. Because... Thomas took the commission of Jesus very seriously. When Thomas discovered that Jesus was alive, he got locked in. He became a contributor. You see, can I tell you something? Some of you are going to keep having doubts until you get busy doing what God's called you to do. You see, doing kills doubts. Doubts. 